few Sundays and we want to go back as we work on this series. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. I have heard comments such as, Pastor, I've never studied the book. I've heard comments such as, it is helping me to get the message of the book. Those comments are always encouraging. We're going to look at Malachi chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 17. Malachi 2.17. And we're going to read from Malachi 2.17 to 3, verse 6. Malachi 2.17. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he, and he delighteth in, in them, or where is the God of judgment? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasing unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerer, Against the, adul against the adulterer and against false swearers and against those that pro oppress the hirelings in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Again, background, Malachi is the last book in what we call the Old Testament, uh, Old Covenant. Uh, his name, again, Malachi, means messenger. And these were messages that were sent from God to the people through Malachi, the man, the messenger. The message was not from Malachi. The message, again, was from God. The message was not about Malachi. The message was from God through Malachi to the people. And Malachi had that responsibility to deliver the word, to bring it like it was. The messages were given after the people had returned from exile. They had been in exile in Babylon. And now that they've been able to go back under Nehemiah and Ezra, they had rebuilt walls and rebuilt temples. And there was some ebbs and flow in how the people uh, were responding to the things of God. They weren't always obedient even when they came back. And God would send prophets like Haggai. He would send prophets um, like uh, Zephaniah and others that would come and try to move the people as close to God as they could be. And when God finally sends Malachi, the people have moved about as far as they could be. And so his message was important. In other words, his message was going to either bring revival or it was going to bring ruin. But God was at this point saying to the people, I need you to respond. Has your mother or father ever called you and you didn't answer? Do you remember what the step up was? Now you got your whole name. And so when they call your whole name, you know that they're calling you and how they've talked to you is about to change. And not only uh, they're calling you, but how they're going to respond to you is about to change. It's one thing when they said, Dwight, Dwight. It's another thing when they said, Dwight Edward Scott. And you could ignore all of that but that last part because that last message, that last word... <laughs> was ominous. It means there's no more time. It means I'm not taking excuses. It means 
You can't run in the door and holler, I didn't hear you. You know, you can't do that. This is God's message to them. This is his, his, his way of trying to getting their attention. And what happened was, uh, the people had fallen into a religious routine, but it was a routine without substance. It's like going to church, no substance. It's like going through the routine, but no substance. It's like a program, sing a song, have a prayer, give the offering, uh, but then go home to our homes or to our lives, and it doesn't translate into anything that God could look at and say, what happened on this day in worshiping me carries through, no substance. And so they were very comfortable in doing what we call the religious things, but they didn't translate into anything. Now for our purpose, this is what Jesus would say to us in our day. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, but he that doeth. He would also translate it in this way, that God is not interested in us just hearing, he's also interested in us doing. Not the hearers of the word, but the doers of the word. God would even put it this way, why, why? Listen to the question, why call me? Why, why take the time, why waste the breath? Why go through the motion of calling me Lord, Lord, and then won't do what I say? So he would, he would fit right here in that time, and he does because he's using the messenger to speak to a people who've arrived at this kind of condition that while they had some religious things going, it really didn't mean very much. And God said, I can show you that it doesn't mean much by your words. And so God has sent Malachi with this wonderful message. He has asked in the message, every time God get, makes a statement to them in the messages, they would have a rebuttal. The Lord said, I loved you. They said, wherein did you love us? God said, you have polluted my offering. They said, when did we do that? And he said, you have been treacherous against me. And they said, well, when did that happen? How, you, how did we do that? Now he's going to make a statement about wearying him. Look at it in verse 17. He says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. And I wanted to, you to understand as, before I go is, First of all, God's not a man. And the weary in here is not of a physical nature. It is more of there's something happened that bothers God, troubles God. You say, well, can God be troubled by human behavior? Yes, he can. God can be so troubled by human behavior that in Ephesians, he says that we're not to grieve. Can God be bothered by us? Yes, we can even cause him grief. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of promise. And in Isaiah, he says, when they were bringing the offerings to him, Isaiah prophet some many years before Malachi, God said again, as they brought the offerings and the bullocks, the goats appearing before him, walking in this course, here's what he said in Isaiah. He says, bring no more vain oblations. He says, incense is an abomination. They were doing these things, but God says, they're not helping me. He said, you got the new moons, you got your Sabbaths, you got the callings of assembly, and God says, I cannot away with it. In other words, he says, you may as well stop. He says, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. Now watch the words. He says, they are trouble. They trouble me. And he says, I'm weary to bear them. He's not physically weary. But God does not want us to worship him vainly. He does not want us to worship him empty, with emptiness. The worship we offer to the Lord should have true substance, something that's real. That's why even in our worship, according to John, if you're going to worship God, you have to worship him in spirit. And you have to worship him in truth. It's not one or the other, it's both, spirit and truth. Because the spirit is never going to be void of truth. Truth 
should never be void of a spiritual worship. And he says that's the kind that God is looking for. He's seeking for that kind of people to worship him. And the issue is, do I want to be that kind of worshiper? Now watch this. Worship is never for another person. See, do, a lot of times when we, we make long prayers or we, we, we put on robes, as Jesus says, and put ashes on us, he said you do it to be seen. But our worship is never to be done for another person. Our worship of God is because God is looking for something real that's within us that he wants us to connect with that is within him. So anytime we worship, anything we do, it should not have how does this appear to the other person. Now certainly there are things that are right and wrong, but the major concern is not does it impress or do you see it. It really starts with I'm here with God and I'm in his presence in everything that I do so he sees me, he knows me, and he's the one that I, I'm to worship. That's where it starts. Now, we're not to grieve him, and here he speaks about God being weary. Watch their rebuttal. When God said, you wearied me, they said, yet you say, we're in. When did this happen, Lord? How did we weary you? Now, it's all right to ask God a question, but you better be ready for his answer. Now the hard part is when God asks you a question. That's the one that's challenging. Uh, Jesus is, I mean the, the writer is letting us know that the response of the people was they wrestle. You know, we've come back to the land. This is the summation. And we've come back with an expectation you know, we thought that once we got into the land, rebuilt the temple, it was just going to take off and we were going to get back to our former glory. But that hasn't happened. And we, not only has it not happened, we've, we've run into difficulties from our enemies who are all around us. And then because of that, the people begin to drift, lose hope, lose, lose, lose sight of uh, what they were to, to, the promises they were to hold to. And as they get, did, they were going through the motion, but they were drifting away from what they really believe. Where are the blessings of God from the, from the prophets? That's what they want to know. And they brought it up in an age-old problem. Lord, if you are really all for us, then we want to know why is this happening and why is that happening and why are we struggling and here our enemy is over here prospering. It's an age-old question. And they ask it, when you say that doing evil pays off, doing good does not pay off. You can get flipped, even in the house of God. You see, you're trying to live for God. And you, you see how others who don't live for God drive, what they're driving. And you're trying to live for God, and you see where other people live who are not trying to live for God. And here you are struggling with things and those who are not living for God seem like they got it made. It's an old age question and you have to, and they do ask the question, is that then Lord, why is this happening over here? In the book of Job, uh, Job asks and wrestles with this question. Job chapter 21, Job had to deal with this. Because as you look out, Examine your circumstances and others, you could trip up. Job 21, he says in verse 7, Wherefore do the wicked live and become old? Same question. The wicked are living long. The righteous are dying young. Good people going away. Bad people staying here. They wrestle with it. He says, their seed is established, verse 8, in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. They don't seem to have a hand of chastening or stroke. They're doing wrong, but nothing's happening. Now, we, if you're not careful, there's a thing that sets in. You know, when you, when you love someone and you lose someone early, and you look around and see wicked people staying here and just staying here. 
it can trouble you that they're still here and here's somebody trying to do right is gone and if you're not careful, you can get in that vortex and get caught up trying to deal with that and you won't have no answers and therefore you pull away from God. He talks about their bulls are not failing, their calves are dropping calves, they, they're not barren. They, they have kids, they, the children are happy, they well dressed, they well fed, they got swimming pools, they got they got every kind of toy you can name and, and here we are struggling to get something. They take the timbrel, they have music. Uh, they, verse 13, they spend their days in wealth. Job struggled with this. Now, here's what you have to do when you run into questions about God's goodness to your life. When you read the Bible, don't start reading the first part where he asked the question, Lord, where did this happen? Read the rest of what Job had to say. Look over in Psalms chapter, 30, chapter 73. Again, they, were, they threw this question up to God. Uh, why? Why, did the, why is the wicked? What, what profit is there to live good when the, the good are suffering and the bad are, are going on? And in Psalm 73, the psalmist writes the same question. And this psalm has become a real stabilizer for me whenever I run into difficulties. In Psalm 73, verse 3, he says, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there was no bands in their death, and their strength is firm, and they are not in trouble as other men Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. And then it talks about the eyes standing out, and that's that proud look. They're corrupt, and they seem like they can speak things and get away with it. They set their mouths against heaven, cuss God, cuss man, uh, d defy God. I don't need God. I, I, I'm a self-made person, and Lord, look like nothing happening to them. Now, you know, we are funny people. We sometimes believe that if we were God, we could handle this world a lot better than God could. You see, we would fry some folk just as soon as they said something wrong. Amen. We'd bake them right away. We'd, we'd put a little something on them. Uh, I mean, and we wouldn't give them no time. It would be instant. And if he's a God of justice, why doesn't he do that? And at the same time, Lord, why is it that good people are suffering? If we were God, we wouldn't let nobody suffer. We would, we would bless every day. Health would be there. O.B. Barry would be here if it was up to me. If we, were, if we could be God, we would try to say, Lord, I got a better plan than this one. James Brown had a song years ago. He didn't write it, but he, he did sing it. If I rule the world, as if to say, I could run this thing a lot better than God. Now, you know that's foolish thinking. But sometimes men think they can do better than God. This is how I would do it if I was God. David said, you got to watch that thinking. He says, uh, <laughs> look if you would in Psalm 73, in verse 13, he says, Verily I have cleansed my hands and my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. Lord, I'm trying to live right, do right, play by the rules that you have written, follow the book you've given me. God, I'm working every day. I am uh, giving you what belongs to you. And God, I'm struggling. And here's some old boy, that, a girl that drank whiskey all the time, just walked in the joint, bought a lottery ticket, and they already... Trillionaire. Do you struggle with it? And the tendency is, Lord, uh, what if I just tried it one time? Would it, can I get some absence on this and it'd be okay? Because it looked like the wicked is, they're getting it. He said, I'm, I, I've done this in vain. I, I plague myself, chasing every morning. He's talking about the discipline, the things that we say, God does not want us to do these things and we exercise the discipline under the Holy Spirit to restrain from doing it. He says, now what benefit is it if the wicked are doing better than the righteous? But he says in verse 15, he said, if I talk like that, if I say those things, I would offend against the generations of your children. 
So God, if I start talking like that and acting on how I looked at this thing, God, it would be like thumb in my nose after a generation of people who put their confidence in you, who trusted in you. And I would be abandoned in my heritage because there are people who says, who have told me, who said to me in difficult times, God does not put any more on you than you can bear. Generations have said, you, you can't question, you can, but they thought you shouldn't question God because God was just God. And they were right. I, I know you can question, but in their mind, they're saying, whatever God does, he's God. And, and you shouldn't try to tell God, bottom line, how to do his business. They were right about that part of it. Verse 16, he says, when I thought to know this, hurt my head, it's too painful. Emotional confusion. He says, I struggle with it. Verse 17, how long and when did you struggle? He says, until. I had a problem with it. What happened, they, what happened some is I went into the sanctuary. And when I got into the sanctuary, I recognized that God is God. Can the potter, can the clay tell the potter what to do? Amen. Secondly, because God has not operated on my timetable, did he stop being God? And the answer is no, he's not. If he doesn't sit down at my coffee table and explain life to me, is he God? And the answer is yes. Because God is God, man is man. And then thirdly, God, when I went into the sanctuary, he said, I understood they got it good now. But that's going to flip. And one of these days, our troubles are going to go away because he says, now I understand. I would rather have trouble I can't understand on this earth trusting God than to turn away from God and spend life not trusting him and then have to see him someday. I would rather struggle with why, why this and still trust him and you do like Job, he had to do it, struggling, but he said, though he slay me. If he, if he took his own hands and killed me, I'm still gonna what? Trust in him. That's where Job was, and he said, I would sin against the generations who stood there if I stood anywhere else. And so they were challenging, at least in Malachi's day, why should I do live for God when the wicked are just prospering. Go back to Malachi, getting away with everything. In Malachi, chapter two, verse 17, when did we weary God? And he says, when you said that, he that doeth evil is good, meaning they got away with it, and what good did it do the otherwise? God must be pleased with them. The word delight means he must not find anything wrong with it because he hadn't dealt with it. But then they asked the question, three parts to this. He that doeth evil, God delights. And then now they say, where is the God of judgment? Now I'm gonna say this now and I'm gonna say it again later in the sermon. Be careful what you ask for. Where is the God of judgment. Now what they were doing was, when somebody knows something, stay with me, to be wrong, that can be a drift or a shift. Here's the drift. When something is wrong, and you know it's wrong, if you're not careful, you could start wishing it wasn't wrong. There's some things I wish wasn't wrong, but they're wrong. Now, if you stay too long with the wishing that it wasn't wrong, pretty soon you'll get, arrive at a place called, well, I, I'm really not sure if it's right or wrong. You'll start doubting it. It'll be, uh, well, maybe not. But see, we've been down this road before. We've been here. God says, don't eat. <laughs> and somebody said, I sure wish I could eat. 
And then after they looked to see if they wished they could eat, then they wondered with suggestions, is it really wrong to eat yes or no? And it went from wishing to doubting until now they're going to do what's wrong and find reason to excuse it. Hmm. You see, now it's under only wrong if it's under certain circumstances. I hope you're hearing that. See, it was wrong until the circumstances changed. I hear people just on this subject of adultery, they try to justify it. One, one of my relatives, I hope he's not looking on TV, but if he is, I'm sorry. But he called me, he was at a girlfriend's house and he asked me, you know, he's married, and, and he asked me, is this wrong? And I said, don't call me with no foolishness like that again. <laughs> he said, well, talk to her. Put her on the phone. But, but, but how can love like this be wrong? So now they were trying to let love change the circumstances. Circumstance of love changed what was right and wrong. And I literally got angry with him. I have to be honest with you. I told him, listen, don't call here no more with no foolishness like this. I said, now, you know it's wrong. You're trying to find justification for your wrong. And I'm going to quote some scriptures that tell you're wrong. Thou should not commit adultery. You're trying to find wiggle room to get out of this. And I said, it's wrong going in. It'll be wrong when you get in it. It'll be wrong when you stay in it. Three months later, he called me. He said, I sure apologize. He said, because you were right. I said, no, I wasn't right. Scripture was right. That's what was right. But what you were about to do is get yourself in a mess. And after you have had your feel of love, you would have found out it wasn't about love after all. Listen to some of our songs that somewhat move in this direction. If loving you Put it to music and it sounds good. But that's a subtle trap. It's wrong. It's just wrong. Listen to the, the words, Nancy Wilson. Guess who I saw tonight? Listen to the words. Put it to a song that seems to justify it. Listen to the song. I've been watching you. You may not remember that old song, but I do. Listen to the song, me and Mrs. Jones. Just because, just because you put lyrics to it doesn't make it right. Now some of y'all know too much about these songs. They're kind of bothering me right now. <laughs> hey, I ain't always been saved. I'm being honest about it. But y'all know a little bit more about this than I thought you would. Even some of these young ones know the song. But, but humanly speaking, we try to change the right or wrong of it circumstantially. If you're listening to me, not only adultery, man with man, woman with woman, it's wrong. And you could call it love 50 times a day, but it still won't change it. You can change your gender by surgery, but when you, the dust settle, you steal what you were born. It's wrong. It isn't that God loves you. He wants you to know the truth because it's a lie that you believe if you believe anything other than the truth. <laughs> now God's going to answer them, but how does a people get to those kinds of conclusions about what's good and bad and right and wrong. And oftentimes it's because we get insensitive. Scar tissue sets in. You got to have a moral compass, folks. You can't, you can't jettison your moral compass and your moral compass doesn't come from you. If we, if, we, if we were the one who established what was right or wrong, that would be one thing. But that's established by God. And if you jettison the moral compass that he gives us, it's no wonder that a nation or a people or a church can drift into some trouble. And then they hold up their worship to say, God, 
is this all right with you? It drifts. My Bible says, and check me if I'm right, right or wrong with this, be holy. Why? He didn't jettison that. It's still there. And he holds us to that. So God is going to answer them. Watch quickly as we get through this. God, statement of God to them. The people try to re rebut what God said. And now God is going to give them an answer. His answer to their rebuttal starts in chapter 3, verse 1. But you got to understand me. Watch me. When they said, what did we do wrong? How come doing God that lights in people that are evil? Where is the God of just judgment? God is going to jump over centuries to give them an answer. And in chapter 3 and verse 1, God's going to take a leap into the future to answer their question. Because for Malachi, 400 years is going to go by and God is not going to speak through another prophet for 400 years. He's basically saying, I have said and done all I can do, and I know I'm wasting my breath at this point. So God does not talk to them through a written prophet for 400 years. So what, what Malachi does, he says, to answer your rebuttal, I'm going to just, through the Spirit, lift you some centuries into the future and I'm going to talk about a messenger. He says in Malachi 3.1 Behold I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. Watch this. And the Lord, the one you've been talking about, the one whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight and behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. 400 years, he jumps into the future. Turn your Bible over to your next book, which is Matthew chapter 3. 400 years later, we land in chapter 3, and we see this messenger that Malachi wrote about. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, pay attention. It says in those days, came John the Baptist. What did John come doing? Preaching in the wilderness. John says he came. Verse two says, and he, he came saying, <laughs> good Bible word, repent. Not reform, repent. He said, you need to repent. Now, let me help you explain the word. The word repent means turn it around. That means stop going this direction, start going that direction. It doesn't mean stop, look back, keep going. It means stop where you are, turn it around. And John came telling the people, listen, when it comes to a relationship with God, God has never moved. That's why later he says, I'm the Lord, I change not. I haven't moved, you moved. And if there's turning to do, it has to be on human part. That's part of the problem with human nature. It will not recognize that it needs to turn its heart back to God. It almost says, God, come get me where I am, and that's not what God's gonna do. So he says, repent. And John came preaching, verse three, this is the one that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And then he talked about John, how he dressed. He was a weird dude, because John didn't dress like everybody else. He, he dressed with camel hair and he, he ate locusts. How would you like to eat locusts for breakfast, dinner, and supper? And by the way, someone said, yuck. Well, if you're hungry, you eat it. But locusts is 90% protein, so he was getting all this protein from the locusts. And I've heard that honey, wild honey, is a stimulant that makes you think. Well, I ought to be eating a whole lot of honey. <laughs> they said it helps and aids memory. I read up on honey years ago, what is it about honey with John? And it was to make him as, as, as sharp as he could be. So John focused on just those two things as a diet. And then the people went out to him. 
And then John had a message. He said, hey, you better repent or this is what's going to happen. Now notice, look at Matthew chapter 11. Malachi said a messenger is coming. Look at what Jesus had to say about that messenger. John had sent some people to ask Jesus some questions. And Jesus answered John and sent the message back. And in, Mal in Matthew chapter 11 verse 7 says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, What went you out into the wilderness to see? He said, Did you go to see a reed shaken with the wind? Hmm, interesting. Sometimes when people go or come to hear truth, be careful that you're not coming to hear what you want to hear. See, John was not to give a message like the wind. That's not the message. Did you go to see a reed that would just, no? He said, you want to go listen to an oak tree. Something that was established. He said, did you go out to see a man that was clothed in soft raiment? Someone who was concerned about themselves only, putting his need above the people. He says, behold, they wear soft clothes in king's houses. Did you go out to see a privileged person who was pampered? He said, no, that's not what John was. John was a soldier. He says, did you go out to see a prophet? He said, yep, more than a prophet. Verse 10, for this is he of whom it is written, Malachi said it, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. He says, John was that messenger. Malachi said, okay, for you that are talking about this, this age-old question, why is there poverty and why are there babies' bellies like this and they're hungry and where is there war and why are children born with deformities and uh, why does this person get away with evil? While we're asking those questions, Malachi says, let me take you to the real answer to those questions. And it wasn't that John was the answer. John was the prophet that was going to announce the answer. John is the one who would say, behold, he's the only prophet that got to introduce Jesus. He's the one who said to the world, he is. John had that, not Malachi, not, not Micah, but John had the privilege. That's what made him great, not in himself, but he had a privilege that no other prophet had because Jesus came in John's day to be an answer to what was wrong in the nation. And John had already preceded him by telling him, you know, the nation in order to be ready for him needs to repent. And so John said, I've announced it. Malachi chapter 3. Watch what he says in Malachi 3. He jumps ahead to talk about Jesus. And Jesus is the solution to the world's problems. Now, for a minute, indulge me. And if I get a little Arkansas on you, I can't help it. But I need you to know that when Jesus came in this world, my Bible says... When he came to the years of maturity, his ministry, he went around doing some good. Listen, my God, the one that people said, well, why isn't things better? He healed everybody that was sick that wanted to be healed. He did it. He never found one case that he sent away and said, I'm going to refer you to somebody else. Everybody that came blind, he gave them sight. Everybody that was lame, they walked. Everybody with leprosy that wanted to be clean could be clean. He was the answer to what Malachi said their question was. When he came, he came doing all of this. Well, what about the eels? Well, he can, you're not going to have a food issue because I can take a few loaves and a few fish and take care of world problems. You're not going to have a storm, a weather, climatic issue because I can tell the winds and the waves. Lie down. And you don't even have to worry about the grave because I can stand in front of that and say, hey, you in there. Come on out of there. I'm getting a little Arkansas on you and I don't mean to, but I can't help it. He was the answer to their question. But they rejected him. 
Now the next time, now Malachi is about to leap some more time into the future. See, the first time he came suddenly, now in verses two and verse three, Malachi is about to leap. He's actually leaping beyond our time that we currently are in. Because now he's talking about another coming. But who may abide the day of his coming? You, that question, where is the God of judgment? Be careful what you're asking for. And who shall stand when he appeareth? Because now, you know that Jesus, that answer that he gave you that you rejected, he's coming. The first time he rode a donkey. Symbolism, a, 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 a peace. The next time he rides a white horse, that's war. The first time he came to bring salvation. The next time he brings wrath. The first time they touched and hit him and plucked out his beard and spit on him. The next time nobody is going to lay a finger on him. I mean, that's it. You say, well, why did he and do all of that? It's so we could be saved by grace. But if you reject grace, now you know that God of judgment, everybody said, where is it? You don't want him coming in judgment. But he's coming. And when he comes, who shall stand when he appears? When I read Revelation of the trumpets and the vials and the seals, all of that is bad. Everything in Revelation is bad, but if you read Revelation carefully, at the end of Revelation, the scripture says the kings and the people of the earth are going to run into the caves and into the mountains, and they're going to ask for the rocks to fall on them. Watch this, and hide us, not from those things, but from the face of him. Mm. All these bad talking people about Jesus. All the jokes they tell, all the humor, all the movies that, I haven't seen it, but I don't think I want to. They got a new picture. I saw the advertised yesterday they called a preacher. And when I saw the advertisement, I said, it's gonna be a waste of time. I already know that's Hollywood. All, all, of, this, all of this that Hollywood writes and, and, and mocks God about, it's gonna be over with. He showed sit, verse three, as a refiner and a uh, purify of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. And then you take another leap. There's about three leaps in here because Malachi leaps from his time to the time the Messiah comes the first time. And then he leaps again to the time that the Lord is coming back the second time. And then Malachi is even gonna leap us into what we call the millennium age. He's even gonna take us there because everything that we see wrong Everything they said, where is the God of and where, why is the righteous? He says, when you get to the millennium stage, none of that is going to exist. Now, this is not eternity yet. That's the millennium stage. He says, there's going to be an offering from Judah. Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto the Lord, like they were in former days. When you look around, you're wondering, is our world going to get better? Or worse? The answer is twofold. There's going to be day and then night and then day again. The world is going to get worse. I'm sorry. Don't mean to frighten you. I hope I'm not telling you something you don't know. But this world is going to get worse. All of our technologists won't stop it. All of our intellect can't stop it because man does not have an intellectual problem. He does not have a technical problem. He does not have, in some sense, the, the money. There's enough money to solve. There's nobody that need to be hungry. There's enough money in this world to solve that problem. So the, man, the problem is not money. It's human hearts. It's the human heart. And it is only him that can deal with the human heart. So there's a purging. There's divine judgment. In verse 5, he says, listen, I'm going to come near. Everybody that's been talking about where is judgment, there are some things God has let. The word he I'm going to use is, he didn't, he's not, that, not that he's going to not judge it, but Acts says it this way, the time of this ignorance, God winked at it. But that doesn't mean he dismissed it. 
So why would God wink at wickedness? Because for that brief second, he overlooks it. For what purpose would he overlook it? So that he could show the person who's committing that act something called mercy and grace. You know what, we're beneficiaries today and I, I must acknowledge and, and so should you. God was so long suffering towards you and me. Talk to me, I saw your hand go back there. God was long suffering. He could have judged us at any point in the past. At any point and place in the past, we were due for a visitation from God. But his mercy and his love and his, and his goodness caused God to show us enough long suffering till we got to a point we had enough sense to say yes to Jesus. But he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. He could have condemned us all and been just, but he, he spared us. God is not willing that any should perish. He's long suffering to us. With. That's, that's what he expressed towards me and that's what he's expressed. So when you look at our world and it's all messed up and what's happening, you say it's bad out here, but God is still extending long suffering to some folk. He's still waiting on somebody uh, to say yes to him and he's not going to close that door until the last person says yes. And then he comes. And when he comes, all the bad talk that people do about him. Nobody cusses with Buddha's name. <laughs> but they do with God. They don't cuss with Jesus' name. <laughs> Isn't it strange? But they have found a way to put Jesus in all kind of profanity. With no other name like that one. But one of these days, that's going to stop. Amen. And what's going to happen, saints, is we're going to see the benefits of having, yes, had questions about what's going on in our lives, but at the same time, having confidence that when he comes, all that has transpired in our life, Paul put it this way. He said, I light affliction. It was just for a moment. I'm trying to comprehend that verse. Because one of these days, whatever you're going through, you're going to look back and say, oh, done. Because now you have to live with your troubles in light of eternity. And by the way, when eternity starts, trouble just kind of goes away. And that's why he could refer to it as a, a light. Not that it wasn't an affliction, but when you view it, looking at eternity, it doesn't weigh to the scale. Now, whatever your troubles are this morning, Song says, and it's true, trouble don't last. What? Always. Sick? <laughs> I understand. I don't know why. Look like people that live wicked don't have to take no medicine. We got all kind of pills. Okay. We got pills everywhere. Wicked people, they just run around doing what they, they won't do. You know, you and I have a wreck, and we got to go to the doctor and have surgery. Somebody high, drunk, have a wreck, they walk away. No injuries whatsoever. Please explain that to me. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and two guys wrecked the truck, went up a guy where on a telephone pole, flipped the truck over, slid into the curve, and when I ran out the door, I knew I was going to see a gruesome scene there upside down that I do not want to see. So I told Geneva, stay in here, and I'm running to get to him just about a, less than a quarter of a block away. And I get there, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, get your heart ready, get your mind ready, but help wherever you can. Both of them crawled out of there, sat on the corner laughing. <laughs> and this is what they said, man, that's the best wreck we ever had. I would have been dead if I had tried something like that. They get away with stuff we can't get away with. Now watch this, you said, why? God's long-suffering. Even they. Now, if we died every time we was drunk, I'd have been gone a long, long, long time ago. But God was just what? Long-suffering. Not mean that he enjoyed it. He was just being long-suffering. Now, he has been long-suffering to us. 
And if he would use us wisely in this world, we want to tell people we live some real lives. And what God has done for us, he can do for, he can do for you. Amen. Amen. Father, we want to thank you. What a day. Joy to be in your house with your people. Joy to be with you, Lord, this morning. Joy to read your word. Joy to study your word. And Lord, for me personally, a joy to proclaim it. But Father, we don't want it to fall on ears that won't hear, hearts that won't respond. Our world is in a mess. We could question what's going on. But Lord, in a real sense, Malachi held a confidence that the future was brighter than the present. And that isn't because time takes care of things. Malachi saw a person. And Father, we're keeping our eyes fixed on him that has already come, who for us is one day gonna come the second time. But we, get a, we got two parts to this, Lord, because when he comes the next time, we meet him in the air. And when he comes that time to the earth, we come with him. What a joy and a hope we have. And we thank you for it because we know these troubles that we experience they'll all be over. Father, help us to keep our eyes focused on him, that answer to the questions that they ask. And Father, may we not have that cynical heart that is looking for reasons to do wrong because we can't understand some things. As a matter of fact, not understanding things makes us write them down in a book so that one day we can see you and ask you about them. But I have a feeling, Lord, when we see you, Everything that we write down that we have a question about, when we see you in glory and eternity, it won't matter. It won't make any difference what's in that book. It'll all be gone away and we'll say, what, what purpose did that serve? So help us, God, to be a people of faith as we await your coming. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.